As is often the case with pivotal historical events, specific details of the Stonewall Riots in June 1969 are not clear. In many ways, the Stonewall Inn at 53 Christopher Street in Greenwich Village was unremarkable, characteristic of gay bars of the period, seedy, subject to frequent police raids, and busy. The bar was popular with the most marginalized in the LGBTQ community, including homeless teens, drag queens, butch lesbians, and people of color. In the early morning hours of June 28, New York City police began checking identifications and making arrests. It was unusual that a crowd gathered as the paddy wagon was filling up. Eyewitnesses dispute what singular action ignited the episode, but something did, and the crowd began throwing pennies, bottles, and bricks at the police. Surprised, they retreated inside the bar. When backup arrived, police resumed the arrest, and tactical patrol force tried to disperse the crowd. After about 45 minutes, the riot subsided. 13 people were arrested. As Elizabeth Armstrong and Suzanne Craig have explained, geography played a critical role in the Stonewall riots. They write that the crowd that gathered outside the Stonewall Inn those nights in June represented a cross-section, and I'll quote them here, of the densely populated, pedestrian-friendly neighborhood at the heart of the city's gay life, including some of the most radicalized, skilled, and visionary gay activists in the country. They shared street fighting tactics and alerted the media, who wrote extensively about the raid and riot. The reporting brought out people the next day to see the aftermath. Community members gathered to celebrate gay power. Riot police showed up. Activists blocked the entrance to Christopher Street, controlled the tight terrain around that little sector of Manhattan, and the second night of rioting was on. On Sunday morning, Craig Rodwell organized the distribution of thousands of flyers like the ones on your table, announcing the first time that thousands of homosexual men and women went out into the streets to protest. Reporters produced first-hand accounts of the events, some framed in derogatory language that ignited more rioting later in the week. And thus, the page of LGBTQ history turned. Although the Stonewall riots weren't the first time that LGBTQ Americans stood up for themselves in the face of oppression, advocated for civil rights, or took to the streets to protest discrimination, historians identify 1969 as a watershed moment. John D'Amelio explained, if not a decisive break, Stonewall certainly marked the movement's evolution from a thinly spread reform effort into a large grassroots movement for liberation and the riot itself was of enormous symbolic importance and rhetorical power. Historians are increasingly familiar with the decades of LGBTQ activism that preceded June 1969, yet the mythic stature of Stonewall persists. Armstrong and Craig's analysis of why Stonewall became the moment we celebrate is persuasive. Collective memory theory posits that images of the past are preserved through particular sets of practices. How the memory is embodied through books, statues, memorials, or parades varies, and some forms are more enduring than others. Stonewall commemorations met with success and have survived because the primary form of expression, pride parades now celebrated the world over, resonate with the original Stonewall event. I'll have another lengthy quote here from Armstrong and Craig. <clears throat> They write that parades are ephemeral and require the participation of many people, features that would seem to make them fragile. In this case, however, the parade as a form meshed with the emotional needs and political goals of the gay movement. Activists discovered that bringing homosexuals together in public had a magical emotional impact. The ritual created collective effervescence by visually and experientially counteracting the view that homosexuality is private and shameful. Comparing Stonewall with other protests before and after 1969, scholars find that LGBTQ activists in New York were positioned in time and space to take up the relics of the riots and fashion them into the threshold of a new understanding of gay activism. Thousands joined the gay rights movement in the years following Stonewall, starting new organizations, managing speaker bureaus, telephone hotlines, and bookstores, making music, writing, working on newspapers, 
at colleges, and through churches. Historians estimate that the number of gay organizations in the country grew from 50 in 1969 to more than 800 by 1973. I'm going to skip over a good deal of history here to highlight the role of the Gay Liberation Front in the gay liberation movement. Like the left in general in the US, the GLF constituted a small minority. People who joined came with experience in the civil rights, feminist, anti-war, and student movements of the 1960s, and committed to an anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-imperialist agenda. They rejected traditional gender norms, affirmed sexual pleasure, and leveled critiques of the nuclear family and monogamy. That is, the GLF was a broadly radical group in contrast to the gay rights organizations that preceded and followed it. Its objective was not assimilation. Rather, the point was to effect change in society, drawing on what historian Martin Duberman describes as a different set of experiences that came from living as a queer person. The GLF was short-lived from 1969 to 1973 in the US, from 1970 to 1972 in Canada. Affinity cells constituted what there was of structure in the organization. There were no applications for membership, no paid staff, nothing like a constitution or mission statement. The GLF struggled with male chauvinism, and although there were disagreements over how much it should collaborate with groups such as the Black Panthers, Duberman remembers that debates over gender issues were more prominent than those regarding race. I appreciate his assessment of the legacy of the GLF. Recently, Duberman clarified, a worthy set of goals had at least been articulated. Inevitably, the struggle to reach them would prove difficult and the results partial. Social transformation rarely follows a prescribed timetable and never one that insists on rapid change. Inevitably, too, the gap between rhetoric and practice produces conflict and turmoil within the ranks of reformers, which then itself becomes a further obstacle. The onset of AIDS in the 1980s devastated the gay community, giving rise to ACT UP and other groups that focused political energy on an unconcerned federal government and slow-acting medical establishment. By the 1990s, sexual liberation had receded as a rallying cry, and the National LGBTQ Task Force and Human Rights Campaign shifted the gay rights agenda toward equality and civil rights. The difference between the gay liberation movement and the activism that followed, Duberman explains, can be boiled down to the question, where do we want to place the emphasis? On liberty or on equality? Tactics follow objectives. In the last three decades, the gay rights agenda has moved from a radical critique of mainstream society to making claims on civil rights within the existing socio-political structure. Activists have taken up traditional tools, electioneering, lobbying, and litigation, in a liberal agenda to achieve marriage equality, the right to serve openly in the US Armed Forces, adoption rights, anti-discrimination and hate crime legislation, and safe schools. Contemplating the legacy of the Stonewall riots in the field of education leads me to consider, very briefly, three topics. Safety and recognition, curriculum, and employment. Physical safety is among the most basic of human rights. Gaining recognition, the freedom to be visible in school, has required civil rights action. Although the first gay student organization preceded Stonewall, the proliferation of gay rights groups on college campuses after 1969 contributed in significant ways to the gay liberation movement. By politicizing sexual identity, claiming constitutional rights of free speech, association, and assembly, and building connections with other political movements, LGBTQ student organizations have educated the broader public and made it possible for more people to come out. Recognizing and protecting LGBTQ students in elementary and secondary school is taking longer. Prompted by the activism of students in gay-straight alliances, reports on youth suicide, and the 1996 ruling in Bosni v. Polensny, school officials and state lawmakers have been stirred to varying degrees of action regarding the well-being of LGBTQ youth. Progress is uneven, 
as illustrated by the broad range of specificity in anti-bullying legislation, recent erosion in federal policy regarding transgender students, and an increase in violence. And on that point, the FBI recorded a 17% increase in all hate crimes in 2017, including over 1,200 based on sexual orientation or gender identity. In 2018, HRC documented 26 deaths of transgender people due to violence, most of these attacks on black transgender women. The trends are not abating, prompting the American Medical Association to issue a warning of an epidemic of violence against transgender people of color. Running parallel are significant changes in Harris polls that track Americans' acceptance of LGBTQ people. Those in the 18 to 34 age group were the only ones to show a decline in acceptance from 2016 to 2018. A third of this age group were uncomfortable, for instance, with LGBT teachers and 39% opposed LGBT lessons in the curriculum. For the first time in a decade, the uh, Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, GLSEN, um, their National School Climate Survey indicated that victimization of LGBTQ youth is not decreasing at rates previously set, and the trend there too is getting worse for transgender and gender nonconforming youth. Progress toward the basic civil rights goal of safety and recognition is incomplete. And as Catherine Lug observed in 2003, protection or non-oppression is not the same as social justice, or for that matter, education. The second point, uh, the Stonewall generation had a significant impact on the higher education curriculum. The University of Nebraska, where's Joan? Joan, I saw Joan come in. Yeah, <laughs> University of Nebraska offered the first gay studies class in 1970, and Cal State Sacramento established the first gay studies program two years later. Scholarship in gay, lesbian, queer studies has proliferated since the 1990s, providing grist for new academic programs in colleges and universities. The curricular landscape in elementary and secondary schools, again, is a different matter. Despite pioneering efforts such as Project 10, launched in Los Angeles in 1984, curricular decisions regarding LGBTQ issues remain at the discretion of local districts in all states but three. There is evidence that schools with curricula inclusive of LGBTQ issues are less hostile toward LGBT students, yet in a 2017 national survey, 64% of students reported that those issues were not addressed in their schools. And only about half of the students who noted that their schools did address LGBT issues perceived that the content was addressed in a positive manner. Embracing a curriculum that introduces students to the gay liberation struggle and invites them to raise questions about sexuality and social justice still requires its own kind of advocacy. It requires a commitment to the basic principles of academic freedom that protect inquiry, debate, and hard questions. We need to claim academic freedom, but in securing this basic academic principle, we need to be aware of the problem of relegating LGBTQ rights to free speech arguments alone. After all, everyone has a claim on free speech, including politicians, school officials, and community members who cast LGBTQ people as immoral. If the validity of my visibility in school rest only upon speech you can challenge, a free speech argument can just as easily be used to dismiss me. The Stonewall legacy has not reached far enough to dismantle employment discrimination in educational institutions. The gay liberation movement helped the nation break free of the explicit purges that characterized the Cold War era, and individual LGBT educators who challenged their dismissals in court were inspired by and supported by some of the civil rights gains in the 1970s. Yet even today, only 21 states in the District of Columbia prohibit employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And just this month, last week, the Supreme Court heard arguments to test this very thing. Some 50 years after Stonewall, we have not secured the basic liberal claim on equal access to employment. The gay liberation movement sought radical social transformation. The hard-won victories we've been able to achieve over the past few decades 
have been critical advances in civil rights, perhaps, as Duberman surmises, a necessary prelude to a more expansive mission. And maybe we can leverage education to help us push toward the greater objective. The high-profile successes, it should be noted, have occurred in conservative institutions, namely marriage equality and the right to serve openly in the armed forces. Here's the central question of the whole thing today. What does it mean, then, that the conservative institution of school lags in comparison? Students still struggle for respect and recognition. The LGBTQ curriculum has yet to be cracked open in most schools. Teachers are not afforded the most basic nods to academic freedom, the right to be, think, and educate beyond narrow boxes of intellectual and social convention. I'm thinking teachers are the key. And so I'm going to pivot back to a point I already mentioned briefly and expand on how the Stonewall legacy has affected teachers. So there's a bit of an overlap. As historian Jackie Blunt has established, the ranks of educators have always included people who today might identify as LGBT, those who desired persons of the same sex or otherwise transgressed conventional gender norms. For much of the last century, these educators engaged strategies that kept their sexual and gender identities hidden for fear of losing their jobs or worse in periods defined by intense discrimination. Blunt describes the history of LGBT educators, and I will quote her as, complex, replete with secrecy, with fear about how gender and sexual norms will pass from one generation to the next, with moments of opportunity and praxis, and finally with an open call to acknowledge our existence and better understand our circumstances. The gay liberation movement sparked by the Stonewall riots was a clear turning point. LGBT teachers came out in larger numbers after Stonewall. A few joined the public demonstrations and annual pride parades that began in 1970, at times uh, famously walking with paper bags over their heads to hide their identity. In his 2019 dissertation, Jason Mayernick explains that teachers were among the first LGB workers to organize in order to fight against discrimination. Many of the leaders of these teachers groups were also actively engaged in the broader gay liberation movement. In this context, some individual educators who had been fired because of their sexuality challenged the unjust actions in court, leading to high-profile cases in the 1970s and 1980s. Collectively, these legal challenges slowly coalesced into a patchwork of laws that provided improved, if uneven, employment protections across the nation although the teachers involved in these cases rarely uh, were able to return to the classroom. Educators also found themselves thrust into the center of the political firestorm that engulfed the early successes of the anti-discrimination laws that started to um, roll around in the 1970s. Most notably, the conflicts were in Florida, California, and Oklahoma. In these cases, anti-gay activists targeted teachers among all LGBT workers in their efforts to obstruct equal access to employment. The teachers were perceived to be an easy target. Gay politics in the 1990s were characterized by state initiatives written to advance or curtail civil rights for LGBT Americans. In this climate of state referendum after state referendum, the impact on teachers was deeply felt, regardless of the particular outcomes of the extended debate and votes. Rita Kissen wrote, Lesbian and gay teachers have been in the spotlight during all these campaigns. If they are implicitly or explicitly out, they become obvious targets for anti-gay rhetoric about pedophilia or so-called special rights. If they are relatively closeted, they are forced to listen silently to hostile remarks from their students and colleagues. And in this climate of hate that referendum campaigns create, their fears of exposure escalate. The most critical legal advance for LGBT Americans came in 2003 when the United States Supreme Court ruled sodomy laws unconstitutional. At that time, 14 states and Puerto Rico still prohibited private consensual homosexual activity between adults. This meant that LGBT educators could be denied state teaching credentials or fired 
due to their status as statutory felons. Shortly after Lawrence v. Texas, legal scholar Lawrence Tribe described it as the gay and lesbian parallel to Brown v. Board of Education. He reminded readers of one of the lessons from Brown, noting, we cannot assume that society's acceptance of such watershed decisions, decisions that mediate revolutions in the entrenched social order, will be a straightforward and predictable process. For sure, okay. Um, the vital act of striking down legal mechanisms that branded LGBT citizens criminal did not lead directly to civil rights, such as equal access to employment. This summer, Williams Institute scholars filed friend of the court briefs with the Supreme Court in those cases testing workplace discrimination. The briefs present a wealth of information documenting the continuing extensive reach of employment discrimination. LGBT teachers remain vulnerable in this hostile climate. And teachers are the key. My professors impressed upon me long ago that teachers occupy the most influential positions in schools. As education historian Paul Violas put it, nothing happens in the classroom that does not pass directly through their hands. This is in spite of a history in the United States that largely has denied teachers due regard for professional autonomy. First, the feminization of teaching in the 19th century left a legacy that still affects how many people view the profession, as if nurturing the development of children and adolescents requires little more than honing gendered traits supposedly rooted in biology. Second, dominant models of teacher preparation, even today, focus on training rather than a broader foundation in the liberal arts. In complicating the situation, schools serve a diverse constituency. Those who have entered the ranks of teachers have worked under the scrutiny of a public that understands. What children learn in school has a hand in shaping the future. Given the wide range of perspective about what that future should entail, Teachers, by political necessity, learn to make their way carefully around controversial curricular topics. They must weigh varying perspectives and read social context as they carry out their academic responsibilities. This is challenging work under the best of circumstances. When teachers' very beings signal a shift in bedrock understandings of gender and sexuality, the teacher becomes part of the curriculum. That teacher's ability to transmit cultural understanding is challenged. The paradox that James Baldwin spelled out in his talk to teachers is made clear. This is how he put it in 1963. The paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. The purpose of education, finally, is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to say to himself, this is black or this is white, to decide for himself whether there is a God in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe and then learn to live with those questions is the way he achieves his own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. So yes, schools tend to be conservative institutions, not deterministically so, as critical theorists and educational philosophers point out. But when they become sites for education, as Baldwin defines it, they roil with the issues crackling through the political economy. This possibility of coming to our own terms about identity, society, and the things that matter distinguishes schools from those other conservative institutions. Consider again the fact that LGBT issues are still contested in schools, even as clear gains have been made regarding marriage in the military. The shared function of these institutions is to stabilize the social order. But regardless of how committed schools may be to particular types of social training and transmitting established culture, there's always the chance that schooling might lead to the kind of education that disrupts the social order. It seems obvious. The fear of thinking in new ways about gender and sexuality, this instability in the school terrain, provokes lingering, intense reactions against LGBT educators. 
Thinking through this question, I am left with two central impressions, and I'm aware they echo observations from a lot of people from earlier periods. Um, but for me, analyzing the 21st century dilemma facing queer teachers has become a vehicle for wrestling with circumstances that confront the teaching profession more generally. One point has to do with the relationship between the status of teachers' job security and fulfilling a school's mission, with links between equity, freedom, and justice. We are still in pursuit of equity in terms of LGBT educators' access to employment. Without that, teachers lack the full academic freedom they need to expand the curriculum. Without that, students' civic education suffers, and they are less equipped to continue the struggle for social justice, however each one perceives that challenge. The second related observation concerns teachers' ability, and I would argue responsibility, to claim academic freedom, the freedom to teach, to the extent possible in any given historical moment. To be sure, conditions are constantly shifting, and require strategic flexibility in terms of action. Nonetheless, teachers should be vigilant for those moments of opportunity and praxis to advance equity in education. Taking stock of the fleeting gay liberation movement that swept through the debris of the Stonewall riots, equity in education strikes me as an unfinished prelude to the more expansive mission. 